Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Yale NUS Global Liberal Arts Symposium. My name is Ashvin from the class of 2025, and I'm a philosophy, politics, and economics major minoring in arts and humanities here at YNC. Before we begin, I have a few administrative announcements I'd like to make. Firstly, please do not take any flash photography or videography during the duration of this keynote address. Secondly, we do welcome audience questions, which we will be discussing towards the latter half of this evening. For those of you who are here in person in the performance hall, please raise your hand during the Q&A session, and you'll find our student associates at the wings of the college uh, hall to pass you a microphone so that you can say your question into the microphone. For those who are joining us online through Zoom, we greatly appreciate your presence. However, do note that we will not be taking any online questions for this symposium. Now, please join me in welcoming Associate Professor Mira Seo, Symposium Chair, Associate Professor of Humanities Literature, and Director of Common Curriculum here at Yale NUS College, and the Vice Provost of Fulbright University Vietnam to give her welcome remarks. Associate Professor Seo, please. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. It's really nice to be back on the stage again and see so many friends, old face friends. Not your, your faces are not old, sorry. <laughs> we are old friends from 2012. I have some very interesting photos from that time that I've been looking through as well, which has been very fun. Um, and this really makes it feel like home for me to come back to the stage. Um, I'm really delighted to share our home with um, a distinguished lineup of speakers uh, in the next few days. And tonight, I'm just honored to introduce my mentor, dear friend, and an inspiration, Dr. Marsha Grant. Um, she's forged an illustrious and unconventional career in global higher education, and that's before global higher education was even a thing. So many of us know how much work it is to found a new one small liberal arts college in Singapore, which is a very well-resourced environment. Uh, Marsha has founded three, uh, Effat University in Jeddah, Aga Khan University in Karachi, and Ashesi University in Ghana. And she's led several others in an astonishing uh, career. So it turns out that when visionary leaders want to fulfill their dreams of changing higher education, Marsha is the one woman SWAT team that they will call in, and she will just run towards that firefight. She is one of the bravest people I've ever met. I did meet Marsha for the first time over 15 years ago through, it feels a little bit like a, like a legacy, a generational connection, uh, through a Swarthmore connection, and this was at my college roommate's baby shower. Um, she herself was, was just here meeting a former student from the Kennedy School, uh, very interesting. Um, His Excellency, President Tharman of Singapore, was her student back in the day. Um, the more I learned when I met her at the time about her astonishing career, groundbreaking career in academia, in the foreign service, and international higher education, the more I just wanted to soak it all in. And I really think that this is part of the inspiration for why I was willing to come to Singapore to join this project. So I hope you also will be enthralled and inspired by Marsha's wisdom, her sense of adventure, her, and her deep commitment to liberal education for students all over the globe. Please join me in welcoming Marsha. Good afternoon. I'm going to show you a few slides from Effet University students, just to give you a taste of where we'll travel this afternoon. This was the, four, the 20th anniversary in, in 2019 when we had a major graduation. Um, and this is the amazing Princess Lilawal Faisal, who knew me for two days and asked me to start a college. Yeah. And is that a question to which the answer could be no? <laughs> um, and then 
my dear friend, EFFET President Haifa Jamal Alayil in her office. Okay, let me start. I have a feeling that we share a lot. I think some of us share jet lag. <laughs> I, and I hope my head is still going around, so please forgive me if I seem a little ditzy this afternoon. Uh, but I think we also share a commitment, a belief, and, and different understandings of what the liberal arts system is, what liberal arts education is. So when I was thinking about this talk, I was thinking, students, here, I'm so excited to meet students of, and uh, it's YNC, Yale NUS College. So if I can say YNC, it's great to meet you students and to hear your enthusiasm and to, to hear what you're working on. And it's thrilling to know that there are so many remarkable people in this audience who have had adventures equal to mine and go beyond. And, and I want to say thank you very much to Mira Sio for inviting me here. I feel so honored to be back in Singapore, which I visited once back in, I think it was 1987. And also I want to thank Leila uh, Lalani, who, Fre sorry, Freya Lalani, who has helped me so much over the phone in setting up my visit. What I want to talk about today is how we take our understanding of the liberal arts system and how this system has been adapted and what the problems are of adapting it around the globe in different cultures. And it occurred to me as I was talking with some of the YNC students that my vision is of historical length. We know that many of the ideas in the liberal arts started with the Greeks, so we have this long trajectory. And also of geographical travel. And we're all part of that geographical travel. And I suspect I'm part of the, the historical development as well. Uh, coming to you tonight, this afternoon. So, what we are all part of is, is an explosion, an explosion of higher education and the development of higher education across the globe, leaving out a little bit, I'm sorry to say, Latin America, uh, but, but in the Middle East, in Africa, in South Asia, in Southeast Asia and in, in East Asia. Education has been exploding in the 1990s and the uh, 2000s. And it's a very special moment. We are all part of this very special historical mo moment in, in educational history. Uh, and there are certain things we've all faced. <laughs> the, the problem of rote education. How do we teach when Teachers have always done chew and pour. Have, you've heard of chew and pour in Ghana? Uh, the teacher chews and spits out to the student, okay, and then the student gets it into the head, and then it's poured out on the examination paper to be forgotten forever, yeah? always forgotten. Uh, we're trying to teach and give an education that isn't chew and pour, that isn't rote education. It is about critical thinking, and I'll, I'll get back to this in a minute. There is such, such a major connection between liberal arts education and critical thinking. But first, what the liberal arts education model is. There are several models of curriculum. Sometimes it's the great books, sometimes it's a core curriculum, Sometimes it's a distribution requirement where students are required to take a certain number of car courses in the sciences and math, in social sciences, and in arts and humanities. Some people define the liberal arts as the humanities, but it really is much more than this. And by having the requirements that students have core curriculum or learn from different divisions, 
they're given different angles of vision. They see that they're diverse perspectives. I think of Graham Allison's book uh, um, about the Cuban Missile Crisis, where he takes the bureaucratic perspective, the individual leader perspective, and then the nation as actor, as state, and, and you get different answers to why the crisis occurred. In the same way, if we look at things from the perspective of a scientist or from a poet, we're going to see different perspectives and get different answers. And that helps our student get to critical thinking. Uh, I have an archetype in my head of the liberal arts model from going to Swarthmore in the 1950s, my God. Um, and and um, I was a kid from California, had a full scholarship, went to Swarthmore, went through total culture shock. The East Coast, oh my goodness, it was more foreign to me. I had lived in South America, but it was more foreign to me than Mexico or Colombia. It, it, it really was, it blew my socks off. And I remember one book, you've probably never heard of it because it was written in the 30s. Uh, it's called Caste and Class in Southern Town by John Dollard, an anthropologist who talked about the color bar in the United States in terms of caste for the first time. And I was blown away. It just changed my perspective on my country. Uh, and I found I couldn't talk to my parents for a while. Um, Although I didn't talk to them often because I was from California and I got one call a semester. Can you imagine? But that's how it was. Um, so also at Swarthmore, I was part of something that was unique at that time, was the honors program. And it was started by President Frank Adelot, who went to Swarthmore as president in the 30s. He was one of the early Rhodes Scholars, and he had studied in Oxford, came back from Oxford and thought, oh, these small seminars, the use of tutorials, we've got to, we've got to have an education like this, reading, reading original texts. We need an education like this in the United States. I didn't know until I was preparing this talk that, in fact, his introduction of the honors program at Swarthmore led to the pr production of honors programs throughout the United States in public universities and small colleges. So I am a product of not only his honors program, and this was a new idea, but I'm also a product of the transfer of ideas from the UK to the US. So it's part of this, um, the way that the liberal arts education has grown and changed over time. Now, for me and in my experience, uh, also teaching at Oberlin College, the first two years of liberal arts is about breadth. And breadth is about getting big ideas. It's about learning in new fields for the first time. It's about the divisional, uh, uh, distribution, so that, that I mean, it's, it's amazing. I was provost of Ashesi University where every student had to take calculus, and there I was having not got further than, than uh, algebra, uh, in, no, geometry in, in high school in, in my day. But there was something in me that allowed me to learn about the way they were thinking and about their fields, and I really think that I was able to go into development of science curriculum, for example. I even wrote a chemistry syllabus at one stage for effort. Uh, that there was something in my liberal arts education that allowed me to learn, that uh, gave me the ability to ask questions and to find out uh, so that I could at least deal with a conversation with someone else and get their help and know what were the right questions were to ask. The other thing about breadth, and it's just one of the most important things in the liberal, art, liberal arts to me, is the possibility of the liberal arts aha experience. And that is choice. That students go to a liberal arts program not having decided, I hope, uh, 
on what they will major in. They get the choice when they get there. And the most wonderful thing that can happen is to have a student go, and I, I collect these stories. I, I know someone who went to Minnesota in business and he had to take an elective and he ended up taking anthropology and he had this moment of, of recognition and he has n now become a well-known person in his field of anthropology and Middle East studies and, uh, and that happened because he had that choice. And I, I live in France and I look at the grandchildren of my friends and some of them go to university and it works and others go and they've taken all these exams and prepared like mad and they get to university and it's not what they wanted or they flunk out. And then they have to look around and try to figure out what they're going to do with their lives, losing several years. And I think this is the, the economy of liberal arts uh, breadth, the first two years, giving a student choice, giving them a chance to figure out what they want to do. And then we have, of course, the depth. And it has gradually come to me over the years that every one of our fields has a language. We have our methodologies, we have our concepts. If any of you have tried to give an interdisciplinary seminar, you know how hard that is. Because, and I did this in, in a seminar at, at Oberlin uh, on Latin American studies, and I was working with an economist and historian, and we really did come at questions in a different way. And we struggled. It took a lot more work than just organizing a, a single course. We struggled to figure out how we could talk to each other using our different angles of vision. So that, that what we give our students, and students what you are getting uh, in those last two years in your major is you're getting a vocabulary, you're getting a methodology, you're getting concepts, and you're getting a set of tools so that you can respect and understand that other fields have methodology, have concepts, have language. And this is really, really important for the future because our questions are so multidisciplinary. If we think of just climate change, how many different perspectives we need. And we need to be able to learn and, and respect the tools that our, our colleagues are using who are coming at things from a slightly different, different perspective. So that's depth and that's breadth. And these are really very important parts of uh, liberal arts. But I think there's more. And it's, it is what you're doing here. And that is, it's a, a whole organization. It's a system of organization of education. So it's student affairs. Um, in France, the public universities only discovered career services a few years ago. And now they're beginning to implement this. I can't imagine a liberal arts college without career services or international exchange programs or counseling. And I, you know, one could go on. It's also the, the way we organize the delivery of education, that there is an order in which courses are taken. And we have the idea of there are prerequisites and you need to take certain courses before you can take other courses. I'll get to why that's so important in a minute. Um, and then I want to mention how important pedagogy is in this system. And all of these components of the liberal arts are moving pieces. Flexibility and change are basic, basic, basic to liberal arts education. And Pedagogy has been changing so much. Even with COVID, we've had to learn to teach in new ways. And, and we're still absorbing that. And I was, I was telling someone in the, the discussion that there's someone named Eric Massur, M-A-Z-U-R, uh, at Harvard, who teaches physics and who learned that he was a terrible teacher, that this, his students were all just memorizing. 
Uh, and then he started using uh, the clicker system where he got students to explain things to each other and then give a new answer after having a quiz. Um, and I noticed, I just Googled him before I came, and I noticed that he has a YouTube discussion on what he has learned about teaching from COVID. So, Eric Masur, M-A-Z-U-R. Okay, with all of this under my belt, and a sort of career over the years in teaching and then as a diplomat, at the age of 60, I uh, started my career. And uh, I was asked by Princess Lulua to help her start Effort University. And we had five weeks. We had a building, that was not a problem. It was an old high school. We had a building, but what do you do when you're going to start a whole liberal arts college in five weeks? You gotta get students. You've gotta decide what are the majors going to be. Okay, what are, you know, you, you're going to have a core curriculum. Well, I had to, I could only get women to work for me. Um, where am I going to find these women? Whew. I I got a book from a, a headhunters of people in South Africa. They charged a lot less coming from South Africa, say, than from Britain or the United States. And I went through this book, and I would get on the phone sometimes at midnight. In the ho I stayed in a hotel, which was completely no-no at that time in Saudi Arabia. A, a single woman in a hotel alone. No, I'd, I'd exercise in the hallway in my abaya. No, I couldn't, they, I, the men could swim, I couldn't use the pool. I couldn't go on the track. Um, so I had to, and, and I called up a woman in South Africa who was a psychologist. And I said, um, I don't want to talk to you right now, because I know you're a very busy person, but can I make an appointment to talk to you about coming to Saudi Arabia? And I, I guess I must be good on the phone. She came, <laughs> and, and we got her husband to come, and he, he couldn't work for us, but we, he could get a job in the international school in teaching uh, biology. So, so the adventure of going to Jeddah to start the liberal arts was enormous. And the first quality that we found once we started the classes was that, that people didn't necessarily know how to teach. And so my role as the dean, I was also, I was the academic dean as well as being the founding dean and stuff, um, was to just to talk about how do you teach. And, and of course, it's, not so, it's something I do, but I, not something that I have regularized, systematized. And that, that was an enormous challenge. The second challenge was that I saw that the students had never exercised and that they had not read either. I, inter I interviewed every student and not one student had read a book that summer. Um, so that was a challenge. Um, and I decided that it was really important as part of the liberal arts to require physical education. And the girls, call them girls, they were women from age 17 to 30. Some of them were married. Um, and somehow having to come to class, not with makeup on and all dressed up, but wearing sports clothes and having sneakers on their feet made us an intellectual college. Our women were the most serious women, and there are more women in university in Saudi Arabia than men, by the way, just in case you think that women are kept at home. No, 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 there, there are a lot of women at university. Um, it, they may not work afterwards, but... Um, and these women, they were so mad at me, they'd come and show me their bruises. Oh, madam, physical education, oh, I'm getting hurt. We had them playing basketball, volleyball. Um, after one semester, they loved it. And, and in 2023, I was back this last February, January, February in, in um, Jeddah. The Minister of Sport had just announced that physical education is now required and available to all women in universities. And so I, you know, I was standing when that announcement was made because I thought, 
I think I was at the beginning of that. <laughs> so for, maybe for you, physical education and sports might not be a part of the way you think of liberal arts. And this is the first adaptation that I want you to consider and that I feel was really important to what we were doing in Jeddah. I left. The minister of higher education found out that there was this American woman as head of the university, and I, I did step on some toes. I didn't speak your Arabic. I couldn't read the documents, and I just went full force ahead. And uh, uh, I did things like I taught students science, all students. And in, in Saudi Arabia, they wouldn't allow women who had not been through the science cone take, take a course in, in uh, biology, say. And I, I foolishly reported at a board meeting, oh, we've had a halcyon day. The women have used microscopes for the first time, and they've, and they've been able to compare their blood and two of the girls are pregnant, and this is so exciting. And, <laughs> and the minister, the Ministry of Education man, was absolutely incensed. What? What? <laughs> How could you do this? Uh, and um, we, I said, I think I'm going to give the floor over to my Arabic-speaking colleagues. <laughs> That was, I, I learned my lesson not to get excited in public about things that were too liberal artsy. There we are. But what has been amazing to me is that Dr. Haifa, uh, Jamal Alayla, whose picture I've shown you, continued after I left. And the first thing she did was to start engineering for women. This was the first engineering course for women in Saudi Arabia. And uh, a few years ago, uh, they, she introduced architecture. And the women have designed a house that won the prize in the Persian Gulf for the best uh, e ecological house uh, in a, a contest that was sponsored by some of the Gulf states, um, which to me is just thrilling. Um, and then she, she and I went to the states several times to the Association of American Colleges and Universities. Now, it's interesting. I think we helped change the name of that. It is now the American Association of Colleges and Universities because there are a number of international universities that have joined, and it was wrong to call it American Colleges. So I think we helped change that. But she got to know especially the women's colleges, but all, I took her to Swarthmore, I took her to Haverford and Bryn Mawr, and she noted that a lot of American liberal arts colleges were started by religious foundations or by churches. And so she said, well, can't we have, a, can't we have an Islamic basis for liberal arts? And I, I will later give you some websites, but you can go onto the website of EFFET. And if you go uh, onto the website of EFFET and look about EFFET, and under that values, you will see the IKRA system, I-Q-R-A, which is the first word in the Quran, and it means read. It is the injunction, read, learn. And she has taken that and created a whole system uh, for liberal arts based on Islam, which is pretty exciting in my books. Um, the biggest change of light at Effet, and again, these are adaptations. Um, when I was there last year, I was in shock because they admit men. This is a girls' college. We couldn't even have a man on campus. We, we built a little room in the wall where I could go and talk with fathers. You know, the father couldn't come to my office. Uh, and, and they have admitted men. And you go into a classroom, and there are boy, men and women sitting around just as they would here, or they would at Swarthmore. I mean, it, it's quite extraordinary. And, I asked myself, oh, has this broken down the purpose of women's education that we were doing? And in, 
I have to say that this is such a revolutionary thing. It's the end of segre gender segregation. And young women grow up in Saudi until now, even afraid of a, a strange man who might say hello or ask for a phone number or something. Uh, the, the fear of, of men who are not in your family is enormous. So the idea that these young women are in class with, with young men from all over Jeddah is just very exciting. And I think it's very much, in my books, an adaptation of liberal education in, in Jeddah. So where I'm going to take us next is to my next adventure, was, which was in Pakistan. And it was in Foreman Christian College where I feel I had the greatest impact. Because uh, at Aga Khan University, we planned for four years. We planned the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, and we spent enormous amounts of money. We spent 39 million planning for something that never happened. It's happening now, but it's not happening on its own campus. It's just in an office building. Um, whereas when I was at Ashesi, for seven million, they built a whole campus. One of the reasons I went there uh, was that they knew how to do things and they could do it on very little. So that it was after Aga Khan University, when I went up to Foreman, that I could take what I had learned about Pakistan and I went to this old university. Here we go. Started, whoops, let me show you. It's because it's it is a beautiful place. It, has, it was started in 1864 uh, uh, by a Presbyterian mi missionary, and they always gave their degrees through the University of the Punjab. And then under, um, under the, I'm having a senior moment, uh, we'll say prime ministers in, 18, in 1970 to 1980, the university was public, uh, made nationalized, and uh, was Islamicized. And somehow, somehow, the uh, Christian Foundation, they were able to maintain their chapel, they were able to maintain uh, part of one of the halls for Christian students. And while the campus was ruined in many ways because there should have been 5,000 students and they must have had 20,000 at some stage, um, Musharraf, when he came into office, helped to privatize it again because he had gone to the old FCC college and was proud of it. And so it, it is the only publicly nationalized school that has been privatized again in uh, Pakistan. So I got there as uh, academic vice president at a really tough time politically, especially between the United States and Pakistan. And I found a system of liberal arts that looked like the system I've just described, but that nobody was following. The, there was no advising system, and the mentality of our students and their parents was, let's take the most expensive courses first. So, so instead of taking prerequisites, they would take the final courses that were the sexiest, they thought and they would put off taking the core courses and the, the uh, general education until senior year. That meant that freshmen coming in couldn't get into the courses because they're filled with seniors. And it, it was a holy mess. And uh, I had a semester to clean it up. It was challenging to say the least. A very different kind of adaptation from what one would expect. You know? but, Ken, I'll give you another example. Um, we had a business school, and it was considered to be very good, and we also had an economics major. Well, the business school was more expensive than the economics major, which was part of the liberal arts curriculum. So all of the clever parents said, oh, our children don't need that business education. They'll all study economics. And again, what a mess. Uh, because 
they thought they were going to have business courses in an economics major. Now, anyone majoring in economics knows that that is not the case. And uh, again, there was a lot of cleaning up to do. And what I learned from this adaptation of, of a liberal arts system that wasn't understood was that we have to learn how to communicate what the liberal arts system is and how it works and how to get the best out of your education actually is following the rules on the whole, you know? Uh, even for the revolutionary in me, I have to say it's following the rules that gets you the best uh, education if you're in the liberal arts system. You start at the beginning and climb the stairs and, and that's, that's how it should work. Well, the biggest change in addition to cleaning up how people approached the curriculum, but I know for years afterwards there were many efforts at communicating both to the public but even to the students and their parents how the system worked, not to speak of communicating it to the faculty members. Um, I noticed that students were not prepared to do university work and that and that they needed to learn how to read, how to take notes, how to, how to organize their time. And so we started the course University 100, and I have heard from professors that it has made all the difference in the world, both in the way they teach, because they've learned to teach from their own experiences. They talk about their own problems of time management, and they've talked about um, uh, how the students now can really start reading and listening to lectures and, and understand what research is in the library. I realize I'm going to run out of time, and so I am going straight to a chezzy. And a, whoops, a chezzy was for me quite an astounding experience. Started by a Ghanaian who went to Swarthmore and majored both in engineering and economics, brilliant fellow went to Microsoft and realized he needed to start a university of high quality so that his children could become Africans. His children were born in the States and he wanted his children to become Africans and could get an education in Africa. This is the courtyard of, of the university. That's the library that you see with the glass windows. And we, it was so cleverly done that those terraces could hold chairs and we could have concerts and lectures out in that terrace and we could also have graduation. And then we had the, the sense of participation. Whoops, now why am I not, there we go. Whoops, the, um, that's a glass wall of the, I will just pass that, but the glass wall of the people who gave to the college and it included the men who were cleaners. They gave their might. They were so excited to be part of that institution. And it said something about the way Patrick and his team were communicating that everybody who worked there was really excited and wanted to support the effort. This is a picture of Patrick who, who was quite available to students and, and who was quite amazing guy. What got me to go to a chassis was this, the honor code. And this is a student signing on, I will not lie, cheat, or steal, neither will I tolerate others who do. And this is the only university in Africa with an honors program where there are no invigilators for exams. Un, un, uh, when I told people in Pakistan this, they un, un, unheard of, they couldn't imagine. Um, uh, and it works, and it works because there's an ethical, there's a course on, on giving voice to values. How do you talk about your values and your ethics in the first year? And the students have to think about this very carefully before they sign on to it, because they know they also are required to report their friends if their friends cheat. So it's, it's very, very serious. It's taken very seriously. The other amazing part of of a chezzy is that they have an, a leadership program that goes for four years, the final year being uh, 
leadership as service. And st the students have started programs that are ex extraordinary. One, it was a school for Baracuso, the village across from us, uh, where the parents came to learn how to read and write and do maths. And some of the businessmen learned how to keep books and, and do estimates. Like if you could imagine, it was so exciting to see the village come up on Monday nights, all dressed in their Sunday finest, to come to the, the college that was started by the F uh, Chesley students for them. So, enough of my examples. Very quickly, I want to think about what we have learned from this. Let me give you a few more pictures. Oops. Okay, these are the websites that I want you to have. Um, what are the lessons that I have learned? Uh, I've learned this really important is for us to be clear about how we understand the liberal arts system and to communicate it within the university as well as outside of it. Uh, and I'm thinking about the Netherlands right now. In the Netherlands, every major university has a small liberal arts college, thanks to Hans Adriansen, who came back from teaching at Smith College in the States and said, wow, we aren't doing education the right way in the Netherlands. And, and there, I visited Roosevelt College, which is attached to Utrecht University. And this is a remarkable program. He also had a lot to do with the, the Bologna process. So, so the liberal arts hasn't moved just east and south. It's also moved to Europe. It's moved east, but also to Europe again. And there are many other examples. Um, I also think that, that it's important for us to be in contact with those organizations that are spreading the ideas of the liberal arts. And I think of AACNU, uh, they do a very good job. Um, the Great Lakes College Association has connections with universities around the globe, and they do a, a very unusual job of even uh, exchanging offices like uh, in different cultures, people don't know how to do fundraising. Okay, the fundraising office of, say, Oberlin College will go uh, to Foreman Christian College, or uh, a professor from Foreman will go to Worcester, or uh, uh, it, it's not just about student exchanges at all. And the student exchanges they had uh, were wonderful, working with companies, learning how to use uh, one's mathematics, uh, say, in, in uh, this was in Goodyear tires, uh, at the distribution of wires in Goodyear tires, and it got one of our students back saying, oh, now I know I want to do graduate student studies in, in mathematics. Um, so I want to conclude on saying, and we're going to have questions, so this is the challenge for all of us. We all need to be clear on what we mean by the liberal arts and liberal arts system, we can have different meanings, but we need to work this through. And we need to know, we need to think about why we value this. What are our values and how can we talk about them? And then finally, and for me this has been huge, keep on learning. Thank you. <laughs>